could join us tonight. I uh, really love uh, talking and sharing uh, about everything I've learned about bird behavior over the years, both at school and just from observations on my own, things I've picked up here and there. Um, so I'll be able to share some of the pictures I've taken over the years and some of the, the behaviors and adaptations um, that birds use uh, to survive the winter. Um, so like Samantha said, uh, we ask everyone to keep muted for the most part, uh, just because there's so many of us on the call tonight. Uh, but I want to make sure I answer any questions anyone has. Uh, so Samantha will be monitoring the chat. I can't really see it while I'm presenting, but if you have any questions, um, please stick them in the chat um, and Samantha will make sure I answer them either during the presentation or we'll have some time for questions at the end too. Uh, so I am going to share my screen, which has the presentation on it shortly. Uh, as Samantha mentioned, sometimes our Wi-Fi isn't the best. So I really hope that mine holds hold up for tonight. <laughs> and if I happen to pause or disappear really quickly, I'll be right back. <laughs> but hopefully uh, it behaves itself today. Seems like it's still loading. And there it is. Okay, so we've got, um, like I said, uh, deciphering winter bird behavior. So in the winter, the temperatures are dropping. Uh, there's less food sources and they're kind of more difficult to find. Uh, and birds and other wildlife uh, can do one of two things. They can migrate and leave the area to find warmer habitats with more abundant food. Um, we're not really gonna talk about that tonight as much. Uh, we're gonna focus on the residential birds, the ones that stick it out for the winter. Um, focus mostly on the different behaviors that they use to survive the winter uh, and also some of the physical adaptations or the changes they make to their bodies that help support those behaviors. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about how to use that knowledge to help birds survive the winter. So first, uh, it's important for us to talk a little bit about why winter is so tough for birds to really figure out what they do to help combat that. Uh, so first, of course, there's less food available for these birds in the winter. And I should mention that we're tonight mostly going to be focusing on smaller terrestrial birds, the birds that live on land, like the songbirds, the birds that you see in the forest, uh, not so much on raptors or other larger birds. Um, they have maybe some different adaptations, uh, although we might touch on them a little bit if they overlap with some of the uh, smaller terrestrial birds. Uh, so there's less a uh, variety of food available in the winter. Uh, there's also less quantity. There's just less amounts of that food. Uh, a lot of the plants that these birds may rely on the rest of the year are either dead or dormant for the season. A lot of the insects they maybe have uh, relied on the rest of the year are have migrated um, or they've died off for the cold season and laid eggs, or they may be hibernating. So they're a lot more difficult to find. Uh, a lot of other species of wildlife these birds rely on, like uh, smaller amphibians or mammals uh, or fish have left or they're hibernating or they've died out for the season. Uh, so it was overall, again, less, less variety of food and just less amounts for them to find in general. And what is there is more difficult to find. So like I said, a lot of the available food is hiding or hibernating uh, to survive the cold winter. Um, or maybe covered by ice and snow, which also makes it more difficult to find. Plus, added to that, of course, is the fact that there's less daylight hours that these birds even have to search for food. So there's less food overall and less hours for them to find it. Uh, added onto that is the fact that, of course, we've got dropping temperatures, maybe not this year as much as in other years, <laughs> but it's still definitely a stressor on these birds. Uh, and maybe even more so for the birds, these little guys that we're talking about today, uh, than other birds and other species that are out there, especially during the nights is when we're really going to be focusing on. So they are spending their days foraging and looking for food to find enough food to have calories and energy to survive the really cold nights. This is a really big deal for these little birds because they've got really small bodies, right? Which means that they're losing heat more quickly than larger animals. So if you imagine like a bear who's got a lot of body mass, they're able to preserve and conserve a lot of that body heat in their core versus imagine like a tiny chickadee, which I'm gonna use as examples a lot. So bear with me, uh, who are really, really small and they have a lot more surface area exposed to the elements uh, versus the, that bear who can conserve a lot more heat. 
So they're losing heat more quickly to the elements because they've got smaller bodies and with, because they have more exposed surface area. They also have a higher metabolism. So they need more energy to run their metabolism. And that is because they tend to run a lot warmer than us. Around 105 degrees Fahrenheit is their base core temperature for most of these species that we're going to be talking about. So they've got a higher metabolism, it takes more energy for them to keep up that temperature. So they spend really just a lot of time foraging. So what these both mean, both of these stressors, is that these birds end up doing this balancing act all winter long. They're balancing finding more food than they do during the rest of the year, even though there's less food available, uh, with avoiding predation, because it's no use finding enough food to survive the nights if a hawk swoops down and eats you while you're looking for that food. So they've got to do this really interesting balancing act. Um, and a lot of the behaviors that and the adaptations we'll talk about today have to do with the balancing act uh, that birds do during the winter. So a lot of what we'll be talking about today are what we call behavioral adaptations, which just means changes in these birds' behavior that help increase their survival. And the bulk of behavioral adaptations uh, they use in the winter are, are foraging behaviors. And like I said, foraging is just means looking for food or for resources. So for example, I often forage for snacks in my pantry when I am bored or procrastinating. <laughs> uh, birds will forage out in the woods or at feeders uh, or meadows for different types of food. Uh, so first we'll talk a little bit about different winter food sources those birds are looking for, uh, different behaviors and adaptations they use specifically during the winter in order to make themselves more successful. So first type of food, uh, not surprisingly, are seeds and nuts. And here in Maryland, we've, I can go over a couple of examples we have here. Uh, if you are not from Maryland, uh, your examples might be a little bit different. Uh, I will share at the end of the presentation some resources that you can use if you wanna look up some more specific native plants uh, around you that are great for birds. Uh, so here in the picture, you can see um, this, uh, the seed heads left over from the growing season for this uh, mixed meadow. And mixed meadows are really great for foraging birds, uh, not just birds, lots of, lots of animals, um, because they retain these seed heads throughout the winter, which is a really great food source. Um, also great shelter because it's a mixed meadow. It's got lots of different types of layers. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about shelter later. Uh, so again, these grasses and wildflowers and different plants in these mixed meadows provide great seeds uh, and different food sources for birds. Um, there's also, of course, uh, different kinds of nuts and like these sweet gums. We have a lot of these here uh, in Maryland um, that you can see birds and squirrels and lots of other animals foraging on uh, throughout the winter. Uh, some other really great examples are beech nuts that come from beech trees, acorns. There's a lot more examples than this. These are just kind of a few basic ones. Um, the really cool thing is that uh, the birds will change their behaviors when they're foraging for this food in the winter based on the weather and how stressed they are. So on really windy days, uh, little tiny birds like chickadees and titmice are going to forage on trees for things like sweet gumballs a lot lower on the tree trunks because the wind is coming in a lot harsher higher up in the canopy. So they're changing their behavior, how they're foraging. They're foraging lower in the trunks to preserve their body heat, right? So less wind coming in, they're conserving their heat. They're maximizing their foraging. So they're losing less energy, which is really, really cool. Um, the other really interesting thing is where they're foraging. A lot of these birds, when they're in these mixed meadows and these forests looking for seeds and nuts, uh, when it's really windy, they'll spend more time in the center of a big patch of habitat like that versus around the outside. Um, that's because of something we call edge effects. It's not a super creative name. Uh, it just means the, uh, the effects that these animals and plants are experiencing when they're at the edge of a habitat. So as you can imagine, it might be a little bit windier around the edge. There's more sunlight. There's more temperature fluctuations. Uh, it might be hit harder by a storm. Uh, so they'll feel more of the effects of winter around the edge. So as you can imagine, on days that are more windy or there's harsher weather, you'll find smaller birds like chickadees and nuthatches and titmice foraging more concentrated at the center of a patch versus the outside. 
Um, side note, this is a really big reason why having big patches of connected habitat is a lot better for these wildlife, among other reasons, instead of having lots of smaller patches. So they're not experiencing as many edge effects. But that's a conversation for a different day. <laughs> so what does it mean for birds foraging during the winter? On cold windy days, uh, they're found more towards the center versus the outside. And this is a really great behavior for them um, to make sure that they're not losing as much heat. Uh, but it does mean there's more birds foraging for less food in a more concentrated area. So it also means they're competing more with each other, right? So someone's gonna go hungry <laughs> at the end of the day. Uh, so these behaviors can have an impact on the birds around them as well, not just these specific birds, which is something to keep in mind as we're talking about this today. Uh, so the next food source, we can focus on our berries. I'm sure everyone here has seen uh, some species of bird eating some kind of berry. <laughs> I can't go over all the different types of berries that are out there, um, but I pulled these two pictures that I have that I really enjoy. Uh, and the one on the left is a flicker, uh, eat, eat, munching on some berries in the winter time. Uh, another really interesting side note uh, that we're not going to get into today uh, is that the pigments in these berries can have an impact on the coloration of these birds, especially flickers, which is really cool. Uh, on the right, we've got a thrush, and I want to say that's a hermit thrush, but I know there's a lot of birders out there, so if you want to confirm that or <laughs> tell me I'm wrong, please feel free to do so in the chat. Uh, I know that that bird is sitting on a holly bush, though, uh, and hollies are really great foods of uh, sources of food for birds in the winter for a couple of reasons. Of course, the berries are food. Um, they also don't drop their leaves, so they're really good shelter. Uh, so the birds can kind of hunker down in there. And we'll talk a little bit more about shelter later. Fun fact about hollies is that they are dioecious, which means that there are both male and female bushes. So in order to get the seeds or the berries and the seeds, you have to have male and female plants uh, cross pollinate each other uh, so that you can get those berries. So if you have a holly bush without berries, it's either that it wasn't pollinated or the birds and the squirrels have eaten them all already. <laughs> it could be either one. Uh, some other great winter berries here are winter berries in Maryland. Um, also, you'll see uh, dogwood or bayberry. But again, there's a lot of other uh, types of berries that are great winter food sources for birds. The last category we'll talk about are insects. Although there are a lot less insects to be found in the winter, they're definitely still there if you know where to look for them. Uh, so uh, really common ones that a lot of birds will find are ants and termites, as well as beetles, both of which can be found uh, in tree trunks. So ants and termites uh, will hibernate within uh, the, the wood of the tree, uh, beetles and their larvae. Uh, you can generally find uh, within the loose bark of the tree. And so of course the birds that are the best at finding these insects are our friends, the woodpeckers who already have uh, specialized equipment on their bodies for doing so. So these are not behavioral adaptations. This is a physical adaptation. It's part of this bird's body that can help it find food and survive. Uh, it might just be more a more important physical adaptation during the winter when food sources are more scarce. Uh, so here uh, is a picture of a red-bellied woodpecker, which we have here abundantly in Maryland. Uh, I believe this was taken at Pickering Creek a few years ago. You can see it foraging on this tree. Um, they've got those long, thin, sharp bills that they can use to bore into the wood. They've got a specialized tongue that actually has little barbs on the end, like a hook, like a little fish hook, that they can use to pull the insects and bugs that they find out of the tree, which is really cool. They even have special claws that they can use to grip onto the bark and they use their tails to help them balance on the tree, which is really cool. But they do have a behavior that they use to help them find insects as well in the winter, a little similarly to what the chickadees and nuthatches do when they're foraging. So when it's really windy, these woodpeckers will orient themselves on the tree trunks in the leeward side of the wind. So if it's really windy coming from one side, they'll kind of forage on the other side to protect themselves from the wind. Uh, and that again can help them preserve their body heat, which is really interesting. But another really cool behavior that has to do with these guys isn't even what the woodpeckers are doing. It's what other birds around them are doing. So here pictured on the right, you'll see a little chickadee foraging for insects on a tree. 
that chickadee certainly did not cause all that damage to that tree trunk. <laughs> uh, they are way too small. They would love to eat insects all winter long. They're great sources of protein, but their bills are pretty small, so they're not able to excavate into the trees the way woodpeckers can do. Uh, so what you'll see chickadees and other birds that are smaller like them doing is following woodpeckers around. That's their behavior. And after the woodpeckers excavate the tree and they might leave, the chickadees and the other birds will swoop in almost like uh, the buffet doors have been opened and they can eat anything that the woodpeckers leave behind. You'll even see on occasion smaller woodpeckers like hairy and downy woodpeckers following larger ones around. So around here, the biggest one we have are pileated woodpeckers. I hope everyone's had a chance to see one because they're just so massive, it's so great. If you haven't, come out to Pickering Creek because we've got them all over the place. <laughs> um, so the pileated woodpeckers are just so much bigger than any other bird out there that they're able to dig a lot deeper into the bark and expose a lot more insects that are hibernating to the world. So they're creating foraging opportunities for all these other birds uh, who wouldn't have been able to eat those insects otherwise. So you'll see smaller woodpeckers and other birds following the pileated woodpeckers around and swooping in once they've left, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, there are other birds that are other insects that are available, not just ants, termites, and beetles uh, that you can find in trees, such as moths and butterflies. Uh, adults and larvae can hibernate at different stages throughout the winter, depending on the species. So for example, the morning cloak moth will hibernate in its adult form under the leaf litter. Uh, you'll find cocoons and you'll find chrysalis from both the lots of different species hiding in the leaf litter, wrapped up in leaves, behind doors, all over the place. So if you know where to look, you can find a nice, tasty, nutritious snack. And then there's some other insects and bugs that are more active during the winter, like spiders. So they might find spiders, spider eggs. They might find flies moving around. So there are insects if you know where to look. Uh, and some birds that are primarily insectivorous the rest of the year, which means they mostly rely on insects to survive. Uh, may in fact diversify what they're eating in the winter because there's just less options available. So they'll kind of just eat whatever they can get. So they change their foraging behaviors that way too. Uh, they're a little bit less picky maybe in the winter time <laughs> than they will be the rest of the year. Uh, so these birds are changing which food they're foraging for, they're changing how they're finding it and where they're looking. Uh, some birds even change who they hang out with while they're looking for food. So another really interesting behavior uh, is some, what we call a mixed species flock, which is exactly what it sounds like. These birds are forming these flocks with a bunch of different species uh, and moving around and foraging together. And this is beneficial to them for a few reasons. They can share food sources that they're finding. So it's just more eyes on the ground is finding more different types of food. And then they'll share that either just by seeing another bird eating much the way that if you're ever on the beach and one gull finds a sandwich that some poor soul dropped, every other gull will see and hear it nearby and flock over to it. Uh, so they'll see and they'll hear everyone else in their flock finding that food. Uh, it will also help alert them to the presence of predators, uh, both because again, there's just more eyes looking. It's kind of hard to eat and scan for a hawk swooping down on you at the same time. But if there's a lot of birds together looking for food, then there's more eyes looking around for different threats. And then they can share that vocally uh, with alarm calls to everyone else in the flock. So these flocks tend to be fairly loud. If you've ever heard one swoop through, uh, you definitely know that it's there. Uh, the composition of the flocks changes based on where you're located. So here in Maryland, they are primarily chickadees, titmice, nuthatches, cardinals, your basic feeder birds. Um, you'll also see other birds like woodpeckers opportunistically joining these flocks. So they're a little bit more territorial. They're not likely to join the flock and fly all over the place. But when the flock comes through their territory, they might join them just to see if there's more food sources available and then leave the flock once they leave their territory. Uh, so you might see them join and then leave and then join and then leave. But if you've ever uh, been in your feeder in the backyard or at Pickering Creek, and you've seen all of a sudden a ton of different birds swooping through, that's your mixed species flock. So you might see them for a little bit, and then there might be no one at your feeder for a while, and then they might swoop again later. So they're swooping through all these different habitats and all these different food sources throughout the day, and they'll probably visit the same ones multiple times uh, throughout the day. 
depending on the time of day and what predators are there and what threats they feel like they may have seen. Uh, so of course, the last source of food that we didn't talk about are of course feeders. Uh, so here is uh, where we come to my first question for the group. There are two basic behaviors that birds can use at feeders to find food and avoid being eaten. <laughs> uh, so you can see them here in pictures. There's one picture on the right, the bunch of goldfinches at the feeder, and there's a couple of pictures on the left that has a titmouse and a chickadee uh, hanging out in some bushes. Uh, so each of these, each sides of the screen represent two different types of behaviors that birds use at feeders. Uh, so my question for you is if you can figure out one or both of those behaviors. Uh, and if you think you might know, uh, go ahead and type it into the chat uh, and we'll give everyone about 30 seconds to come up with some ideas. And then uh, Samantha will share with us if anyone uh, thought of anything. And then I'll share with you what I have on my screen. I'm not trying to trick you or anything. <laughs> the pictures are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the, the feeder on the right is uh, our office feeder at Pickering Creek. We get quite a good amount of goldfinch. Obviously not from this year because we have not had nearly this much snow in Maryland this year. Uh, it's from a previous year, uh, but it is still, uh, it's still I think a pretty fun picture. Let's see, I think I can open my chat up a little bit. I see. Thank you, Laura. I see she's mentioned grab food and fly away to eat it somewhere else. Yeah. Anyone else have any ideas? All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and share. Uh, so the first one is uh, the, the eat and scan is what I like to call it. And these are of course the birds on the right. Uh, so birds like uh, these finches that have really big thick seed crushing bills can eat and scan for danger simultaneously. So they can look down only just very briefly, grab another seed and eat it and crash it open with their beak while scanning to see if there's any predators or other threats around them. So you'll see them swoop into your feeder, kind of eat their fill while they're there and then leave and maybe find another food source. Versus uh, these other guys on the left who are going to grab a little food and then retreat to shelter and scan for threats from there. So you can see the bill of the chickadee and the titmouse and a lot of other birds like them are much smaller. So they have to work a lot harder to kind of wedge the seed into something and hit it or pry it open to get the tasty treat inside. So they can't really eat and look around at the same time. So they retreat to shelter where they can eat their food and, and then kind of sort of scan for threats from there where their back's covered, so to speak. <laughs> uh, so these are kind of two different strategies. Uh, the scanning for threats from shelter, grabbing one piece food at a time and so you'll see them go back and forth or the eat and scan where they're hanging out at the feeder and eating a whole bunch at once. All right. uh, the Keisha concurs look out and wait my turn. Also Lara has some birds who love to knock food out of the feeder and eat on the ground which is something we're familiar with. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> we definitely see that happen at Pickering all the time. Uh, especially not birds, but squirrels love to just shake as much as they can out onto the ground. But I think the squirrels are their, whole, their own little category for many things. <laughs> uh, the, the scanning for threats from shelter technique uh, is why it's really beneficial to have a lot of shrubs and plants with layers nearby. These are providing shelter for these birds while they're foraging at feeders. Uh, so birds like chickadees and chip mice are going to be a lot more likely to visit a feeder if it's got lots of shelter nearby versus in its, if it's in a big open area, they might not really feel safe enough to visit. Uh, so if you want more of these birds to visit your feeders, that's one way to kind of encourage them to visit. Um, another really cool thing that birds do for the winter that's one of my favorite behaviors uh, is food caching. So when these birds are going back and forth from a feeder to a different location, they're not necessarily always eating everything that they find. They, they hide them in food caches, uh, which is pretty much the same thing that squirrels do, right? So they're hiding food primarily in the late summer and the fall so that in the winter when food is more scarce, they'll have kind of a backup source of food that they can go to and they can find. Uh, so. Birds like corvids, the bigger birds like jays, crows, and ravens tend to hide multiple seeds and nuts all at once together underground in one little stash. 
Um, some of them even have a physical adaptation that helps them carry more food at once so they can be a little bit more efficient. So jays, like the blue jay you see here in the picture, uh, actually have a sensible esophagus so they can stretch it and carry more food there. Uh, and then there's other birds like nutcrackers and crows have a pouch uh, under or in front of their tongue so they can carry multiple food items that way. Uh, the amount that they can carry really varies based on the species, um, but I read that birds uh, like the Clark's Nutcracker, which we don't have here in Maryland, uh, but I did get to see out in Washington once, uh, are able to carry as many as 72 pinion pine seeds at once. Pine seeds aren't that big, but that's still a good amount for them to carry at once. So that's pretty cool. But then there's our smaller birds, like our, again, our chickadees and our tent mice that have a much different strategy. Um, so again, they tend to carry one seed away at a time and they'll hide them in single caches, mostly in bark crevices all throughout their territory. So they've got to go back and forth multiple times with seeds to cache. So a lot of the back and forth behavior you're seeing in the late summer and the fall is caching and not necessarily eating. Uh, this behavior is really interesting and it's not quite as straightforward as it first appears. Uh, so they've got to fly back and forth, but they also have to make sure these caches aren't stolen and they have to remember where everything is hidden when they need it. A uh, lot, most um, common North American feeder birds can have anywhere from hundreds to thousands of separate caches scattered throughout their home ranges. So that is a lot to remember. Uh, a lot of birds in order to make sure it's not stolen uh, will make sure that when they hide it, maybe no one else is watching. And you'll see a lot of the times birds will wait to leave the feeder until maybe other birds have left and then they might fly off in a different direction to make sure no one is following them. The corvids, the jays, the crows, and the ravens, uh, who've been shown to be pretty, pretty smart, the way that humans measure intelligence, really great at problem solving and using tools. Uh, they'll hide all their seeds underground in one spot and then they'll put something on it like a seed or a twig or a leaf in a specific pattern so that they can remember where to find it later, which is really, really cool, I think. Uh, but even, even cooler than that is, uh, is what chickadees do. So they actually grow uh, extra brain cells, extra neurons in the late summer and the fall when they're hiding their food in order to remember where everything is being hidden. So they grow these brain cells in the hippocampus, uh, which is the part of the brain that's in charge of spatial memory, so that they can build that map of their territory in their brains and remember where everything is. So they're making more brain cells, they're building more connections, they're losing old memories that maybe they don't need right now, and really just focusing on where all their food is being stored, so that they can remember where it all is in the winter when they really need it. And that's cool just on its own. <laughs> uh, but also scientists are studying the ability of the bird's brain to generate these new neurons. Uh, and they think it might uncover ways to replace brain cells in humans, not just birds, uh, that are lost due to injury, stroke, or degeneration, uh, such as what happens in diseases like Parkinson's and Huntington's and Alzheimer's. So this behavior, uh, this, this adaptation could have really interesting ramifications, not just for other birds, but for humans as well, uh, which is why we study all these really interesting behaviors. Um, another side note is that any of the caches that these birds don't eat during the winter uh, could end up growing into new trees and new plants and uh, providing them with more food in the future. So there's a lot of added benefits there as well. Uh, so caching is a really, really interesting behavior for a whole bunch of different reasons. Uh, and speaking of research, I wanted to you know, take a little side note and talk about some cool bird research. Uh, it tells us a lot about how we know where these birds are going in the winter. So like I mentioned, a lot of the research we do for behavior is observing and watching these birds. Um, but as you can imagine, uh, it can be difficult following a flock of birds continuously through the forest. They're pretty quick. <laughs> so that's a really cool technology like this RFID research uh, comes into hand. Uh, so RFID just stands for Radio Frequency Identification Device. And these devices are used in a lot of different ways, um, but it started to be used to study the movement of birds uh, in the forest by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology a little while ago. 
Uh, and I was lucky enough to be able to use some of this technology for a project that I did when I was an undergraduate uh, because the professor that I studied under used to work at Cornell. So we got to use it too, which was really great. Um, so we put these special bands on the bird's legs that have these RFID transmitters in them. You can see the picture on the top left, that cardinal has a band on its leg, the little one in the front that looks kind of shiny. It's really small, so it doesn't get in the way of where the birds are going, but we put as many bands on as many birds as we could. Each band is constantly transmitting a radio signal that has its unique signal. So it's just a string of numbers. So it's constantly sending out that signal with that unique number. So we know that number goes with that cardinal. And yes, that does hurt when they bite you like that. <laughs> Their bills are very sharp, <laughs> but it, it got it to pose for a picture very nicely. So I, I let it happen. Um, <laughs> so these, these birds are flying around the forest uh, in Lancaster, which is where uh, in Pennsylvania, which is where I went to school and where we did our study. Uh, and so you have this little bands on their legs transmitting the signal. You also need something to receive the signal. So we put these bird feeders out throughout the entire forest in different places and they have receivers on them. And so that is the black square that you can see this chickadee standing on on this feeder, that's the receiver. So every time the bird lands on the feeder to eat, that receiver logs that that specific bird is there and the time that it's there. So by the end of our study, we had a really cool data set of where these birds were going throughout the forest that we could use to track their movements, which is pretty cool. So you can study some of their foraging behaviors. Uh, I also wanted to point out the picture on the bottom left. Uh, that is what the receiver looked like at the end of our field season. It's not what it's supposed to look like, but it shows you a, a good window into uh, what the inside of it looks like. I thought I'd ask if anyone had any ideas as to how it ended up like that. So if you have any ideas, feel free to share them in the chat. <laughs> but it shows you that the inside of the receiver is just a lot of wire that's wrapped around and around and around. And then we plasti dipped it uh, and zip tied it down to the feeders, which we made with PVC pipes. Uh, and then under the feeder is hanging a little device that records everything and a really big battery. So a lot of our winter was spent with me and my two lab mates uh, hiking around the forest with backpacks full of big heavy batteries, uh, replacing them constantly and refilling the bird feeders every couple of days. Uh, and the chickadees would wait for us and tell us that we were being way too slow. <laughs> uh, we had several guesses that the squirrels helped ruin the uh, transmitter. Yep. Yep, and you are all correct. <laughs> that was definitely was the squirrels. Luckily, they waited until the end of the field season uh, to eat them because they're a little bit of a pain to make. Uh, so that was good for us. I could never figure out quite what drew them. It's just wire and plastic. Go figure. Uh, I guess squirrels will really gnaw anything. They also ate the, the, the feeder piece off the front. Uh, it was empty, so I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure why they went for it, but they did. And then the last part of what we were looking at, me specifically, is another interesting behavior that chickadees use, um, which is intraspecific dominance hierarchies. And that sounds complicated, but it's, it's not at all. Uh, so intraspecific just means it's within one species. So these chickadees join these multi-species flocks, but within the flocks, they form this dominance hierarchy or this pecking order just with, with the chickadees, where there's more dominant birds at the top that are more aggressive and less dominant birds at the bottom. And the more dominant birds have preferential access to food. And so if you've ever seen at the feeder, uh, something like this scene, it's a little blurry because it was taken with a game camera, but you can see this chickadee on the top here is most definitely asserting its dominance over the chickadee on the side, which is more submissive. <laughs> so a lot of what I was studying is, you know, when and where were these chickadees being more aggressive uh, throughout the forest. Um, I did take some a lot of videos that winter to kind of back up what I was seeing. And I do have a video I would like to try to share if uh, my bandwidth cooperates with me. So um, I'm gonna go to the next side and I'm going to play my video. Uh, I don't think the sound is gonna come through, um, but uh, what I'd like everyone to do is just watch it. We'll watch it for about 30 seconds and see how many times you can see one chickadee displacing another on the feeder. That's essentially what I was looking for when I was there. Uh, you'll also see at the beginning uh, a little nuthatch hanging out. Nuthatch definitely always beats chickadee at the feeder. Nope. 
I'm gonna try to change the settings if it lets me. There we go. All right, it's a little better. Okay, so you should have seen at least a couple of times uh, some of those birds uh, trying to displace each other at the feeders. Um, and that's, that's a lot of what the study that I was doing was focusing on, was looking at uh, when these birds are at the feeders and when they are displacing each other and when they're not displacing each other. It was, a, it was very interesting. The reason that we're so focused on uh, these different behaviors uh, is not just that it's really interesting, um, but that kind of the take home uh, for why we study these behaviors is, you know, our understanding of these behaviors, it's constantly evolving. Uh, and you can really apply what we learn about their behaviors to conservation efforts uh, and how to kind of help them out over the winter uh, with other stressors like habitat loss, which is why I think it's so interesting to, to study them in the first place. Uh, so that's my little spiel. <laughs> Uh, so that's our, our RFID research, which is still being done to my knowledge, uh, which is really interesting to think about as well. Um, so the, these birds, as you can see in this picture, uh, are big also on finding shelter, the different behavior that these birds use to, to combat dropping temperatures in the winter. Uh, so their safety and warmth in numbers when birds find shelter, uh, safety because they're being safe safe from the elements, from the cold, from the wind and the rain, different storms. Uh, warmth if they're huddling together, like you'll see some birds like sparrows or kinglets or roosts will roost together during the nights to preserve warmth. Um, and then again, safety in numbers, the same reason the mixed species flocks uh, were great for birds, um, that there's more eyes just scanning for predators and for other threats. So birds can either find shelter uh, like this picture you see on the left of the chickadee hanging out in some dense foliage is really, really great shelter for them. Uh, they might also hang out in cavities, either natural cavities in trees or abandoned cavities uh, from our friends, the woodpeckers. Uh, they might even hang out in nest boxes in the winter time. Uh, so if you have nest boxes on your property, it's a great idea to clean them out and make sure that there's no rodents or anything else nesting in it in the winter because some birds will shelter there. Uh, some birds, mostly our woodpeckers, can make their own shelter. Um, we call that a roosting cavity. And it's different from the nesting cavities that they use in the summer in a couple of ways. Uh, they tend to use different trees. So their roosting cavities will be in rotting snags, maybe more than the larger, um, more uh, the better snags, the more solid wood that their nesting holes are found in in the summertime and the spring. Um, they also tend to have them a little bit lower down in the trees. They might not be as big and as well excavated. Uh, sometimes they'll hang out in their roosting cavity for the entire winter, coming back to it night after night. Um, sometimes they'll just use it for a couple of days and then they'll abandon it and then they'll excavate a new one somewhere else. And then of course, when they abandon it, that makes uh, more opportunities for other smaller birds like the chickadees and the nuthatches to use those roosting cavities for shelter, which is really great. So they're kind of creating shelter and opportunities for other birds. Uh, this picture here is a red-headed woodpecker that I saw down at Blackwater, which are pretty cool to see. And this was actually taken in the summertime. So that's a lot of roosting cavity. <laughs> that picture is a nesting cavity, but the idea is the same. <laughs> And it's a pretty cool picture. <laughs> uh, so there are some physical adaptations I wanted to make sure we got to as well, uh, or changes to birds' bodies that go hand in hand with the behaviors that they use to survive the winter. And a lot of these physical adaptations are helping them to minimize heat loss, so with temperature control. So <laughs> uh, one thing that they can do is put on extra fat uh, both as an insulator uh, and to give them extra energy. So if you look at 
beautiful chickadee here, they can put on a little bit of extra fat in the winter, but they have to be careful not to put too much fat on. These little guys, they're, they're pretty small. They have to make sure they're still aerodynamic even after they add extra fat to their bodies. So if there's too much fat, if a hawk swoops in or they try to take off to go look for food, they might just plop to the ground and then they're easy prey or they might not be quick enough to escape a hawk or another predator. Um, so it uh, has been found that in birds like chickadees and finches, more than 10% of their winter body weight may be fat. So they have been known to put extra fat on, but it can't really be the only strategy that they rely on. They've kind of got to do other things too. Uh, one of those are using their downy feathers, which all birds have as a layer under their outer smooth contour feathers. Those downy feathers, uh, as long as they stay dry, are really great at uh, temperature control and at retaining body heat, which anyone who's ever used a downy coat or a blanket knows it's, it's very effective. So all birds have these downy feathers. Uh, some birds, uh, bigger ones like geese and grouse, can even grow an extra set of insulating downy feathers so that they're extra warm in the winter time. Uh, the last uh, example that I have are, is a little bit more of a behavior, but these birds, uh, I'm sure everyone's seen this, like this picture here, these birds will hunker down, they'll puff up their feathers, uh, which is a little bit of behavior and a little bit physical. Uh, which in effect increases the cushion of air around the outside of their bodies. Uh, so there's more heat that's retained in their bodies. They'll also hunker down, they'll kind of tuck their heads and their necks in and cover their feet to minimize the amount of heat that they're losing. Um, and when I was looking for pictures for this, I ran across this comic, um, which is a collaboration with an, a comic artist, uh, Rosemary Mosco, who I'll talk a little bit more about later. But the basic idea, which I approve of, is using uh, the bird fluff as a barometer for how cold it is outside. <laughs> so if you look outside and birds are just a little puffed, it's probably a little cold, but not too bad. If you look outside and it looks like the birds on the right and they're total puff balls, it's probably freezing. And that is my indication to stay inside. <laughs> so I'm all about using the bird fluff barometer <laughs> to tell how cold it is outside. It seems very effective to me. <laughs> uh, but there are other ways that birds uh, use to preserve heat, not just puffing up, although that is definitely the cutest behavior. Uh, they will also shiver. Their shivering is a little different than maybe the way that mammals shiver. Uh, different muscles across their body will contract at alternating times, and that kind of helps generate and retain heat for them, those muscle, muscle contractions. But some of the coolest adaptations uh, are, and there's two kind of different techniques that are used, are, are changing their body temperature on purpose. So some birds like uh, chickadees, black cap chickadees in particular, have been known uh, to undergo regulated hypothermia. And that just means that they on purpose let their body temperature drop below, way below what is normal overnight. So if their body is a lot colder overnight and it's closer to the temperatures around them, they're going to lose a lot less heat than if they try to keep their bodies up at 105 degrees throughout the entire night. That's using a lot more energy. Um, so the question that I wanted to ask um, is how much do you think the black cat chickadee can drop its temperature overnight and still be alive in the morning? <laughs> so how many degrees can it go down and it still survive? One degree, five degrees, 10 degrees. Let us know in the chat what you think. And I'll tell you what I find. I found during my research. It's always amazing to me that these tiny, tiny birds can survive such cold temperatures during the, the winter nights. See 50 degrees, 10, 20. Right, so what I found in my research was that they can drop their temperatures up to 22 degrees Fahrenheit from their daytime level and still survive in the morning. Uh, so if they're up at 105, you know, it goes 22 down and they can still survive in the morning, which is quite the drop, I think. Uh, this isn't used by every bird out there. Um, it's not super common, although scientists are starting to think it's more common um, maybe than they previously suspected. Uh, it takes a lot of energy, as you can imagine, for these birds to then warm themselves back up in the morning. Um, but it's a really effective way of reducing 
uh, heat loss overnight for sure. Uh, the other strategy is torpor, which is kind of like uh, hibernation light, I've heard it described. So it's kind of taking it one step further. They're dropping their temperatures, you know, maybe 50 degrees overnight. Uh, so they're almost going into hibernation, but not quite. It's just for overnight. They're kind of sort of shutting down a lot of their body functions. So they're not really using energy for a lot of things. Uh, some birds like hummingbirds and doves do this. Uh, the pygmy nuthatch, interestingly enough, is the only bird in North America that combines uh, torpor, roosting in tree cavities uh, with other birds and huddling together all together as their winter survival strategy, which I thought was very interesting. That. Uh, the last interesting physical adaptation uh, are what birds use to survive the winter in terms of their feet. So birds' feet are a really big source of heat loss, right? Their feet are exposed. They're standing on really cold things and they're not really insulated or protected as much. So it would be a really big loss of heat for them, but they've got a couple behavioral and physical adaptations that they use to kind of deal with that. So they can go over both of these here. Uh, so in terms of behavior, uh, one of them is actually shown on the screen if you look at the Canada geese on the top. So I wanted to ask if anyone sees any behaviors that these geese are using to uh, make sure that they're not losing a lot of heat through their feet, which rhymes. And if you see anything, go ahead and type it into the chat. I've already seen a couple people put that answer in. Yep, you see there's two geese in there. They're switching which foot they're standing on. So there's this goose kind of in the middle and there's one all the way on the left. And they'll put one foot up closer to their body, which is nice and warm and keep one on the ice and then they'll switch back and forth. And so you'll see a lot of birds do that. Um, and then also thinking back to that picture of the chickadee, when they're sitting out on branches, they'll kind of hunker down, tuck their heads in and they'll cover their legs and their feet uh, with their breast feathers in order to help preserve heat and keep them warm that way as well. But by far the most interesting adaptation, I think, uh, is what we call counter current circulation, uh, which sounds really fancy, um, but and it's also known as regional heterothermy. And what this just means is that the birds are intentionally keeping parts of their body warm and parts cold. So that's the regional part. And heterothermy means different temperatures. So some parts are warm and some parts are cold. So if they're intentionally keeping their feet cold, they're going to lose a lot less temp a lot less heat through their feet uh, than if they were trying to keep their feet the same temperature as the rest of their bodies. So they do that by controlling their blood flow. The blood flow keeps their feet cool and their body warm. And the best way to explain it is really by looking at a picture because it's a little complicated. So bear with me here. So if you look over on the right, uh, if you look at this gull's leg, you can see the warmer blood, of course, is at the top, the red blood. Cooler blood circulating through the feet is, of course, cold because they are standing on snow and ice. You've got arteries and veins in their legs, and they're situated really close together. Right now, there's always pairs of arteries and veins. The arteries are going away from the body, artery away. So they're carrying warm blood from the body and going down towards the feet. Veins are carrying cool blood from the feet back up towards the body. And because they're right next to each other, there's heat exchange between the arteries and the veins. So as the warm blood from the artery goes down towards the feet, it's right next to the cool blood coming up from the feet. And the heat from the artery, the warm blood, goes into the cold blood from the veins. So if the blood starts up here at the body, nice and warm because it was just circulating around the core of that bird's body, as it goes down towards the feet, the heat from that warm blood is leaving and going into the cold blood and warming that up from the feet. So it's going down, it's losing blood. By the time it gets to the feet, it's already cold. And because it's already cold, it's not going to lose any extra heat to the environment and the surroundings. It's lost all of its heat already to the other blood that's within the bird. So they're not losing any heat. They're conserving it all within their bodies. As that cold blood goes back up, it's warmed by new blood coming down. And by the time it reaches the core of the body, it's already warm. So that's that counter current circulation. There's currents 
and they're going counter to each other. That's the name. It's a really interesting adaptation. A lot of other animals like fishes and sharks uh, specifically use it as well uh, in order to keep their temperature stable when they're in the water. They're cold blooded, so it's a little bit different for them. Uh, but it's really interesting. And that's why you can see these birds standing just on ice or on snow uh, and their feet are cold and their bodies are totally okay. And that's a really big reason why is this counter current circulation. Really, really cool. So that brings us to use what you know. Uh, there are a lot of different behaviors and adaptations these birds use all winter long to survive the elements and the lack of food. So if you know uh, what they're doing and how they're doing it, you can kind of help bring them along through the winter and provide for them. Of course, uh, a really big way you can help them are by, is by putting out feeders uh, and a lot of different types of feeders and there's a lot of different types of seeds you can put in them. Uh, so putting out stuff like black oil sunflower and mixed seeds, it's great for chickadees and finches. Uh, suet, really great for woodpeckers. Safflower, sunflower oil for regular bird feed, uh, regular feeder birds, plus other birds like cardinals and roping blackbirds. Uh, you can have feeders like you see here in the picture that we've got in our office. Platform feeders for other birds like maybe morning doves. Sprinkling seeds on the ground, someone mentioned earlier for maybe some of the bigger finches and some of those stewart feeders as well. So there's a lot of different options. Um, and looking on Audubon's website and Cornell's website will give you a lot of great ideas for what type of seed uh, you might want to use, depending on what kind of bird you're trying to attract. And then, of course, it's always great to plant native plants uh, in your yard or whatever habitat uh, you're in charge of. Uh, native plants are a really great source of not just food, like we talked about, the berries and seeds and nuts and this different seed heads. Um, but they're also really great shelter, definitely for a lot of those smaller birds like the chickadees and the titmice who are going back and forth from their feeders to nearby shelter. So if you're not seeing a ton of birds at your feeders, making sure you've got a lot of different native plants and a lot of different layers with shelter nearby is a, a great way to try to remedy that. Uh, having nest boxes out is a great way to help birds as well, not just during the nesting season, but during the winter, as we now know. They're a really great shelter. Making sure nothing is living in there, like any mice or other rodents, uh, is a really great start. You can also purchase roosting boxes for some species if you want to get really fancy, but nest boxes do the job. If you've got snags or dead trees on your property and it's safe to leave them up, it's great to leave them for as long as you can. As we've seen, they provide a lot of foraging opportunities as well as shelter for a ton of different species of birds and other wildlife. Uh, you can also put bird baths out. Uh, birds do need uh, water, although they get a lot of their water intake from the food that they're eating. They will drink or they do have to wash themselves and their outer feathers are waterproof so they can wash themselves in the winter even though it's cold out. Uh, so if you're worried about your bird bath being really cold, uh, you can get heated bird baths, although most birds don't need that level of, of fanciness in, their, in your yard. <laughs> so uh, again, kind of learning about the these birds' behaviors uh, throughout the winter and using those behaviors to inform your efforts uh, for conservation uh, and to, to help them out in the winter, which is apparently and clearly a, a very tough time for them, is why it's so much fun and so interesting to study these behaviors. And it's why I'm so interested in them. Um, so I want to wrap up just by sharing a couple of resources um, that we'll share in the chat in a few minutes uh, if you want to check them out on your own. The Audubon Native Plant Database is a really great start if you're looking for native species local to you, you put your zip code in and then it'll share local species to you uh, that you can check out to provide more habitat and food for birds and other wildlife. It's also always a great idea to check out a local nursery or nature center that's close to you because uh, they'll have some great ideas. Um, so of course I put us up on there as a resource a lot of us are from the Maryland area, so we would love to help you out if you ever have any questions uh, about attracting birds and other wildlife and creating habitat, uh, as well as putting out feeders and native plants. Uh, we do programs uh, based solely on native plants and feeders and feeder watch and programs like that. So be sure to check out our programs in the future. Um, and I wanted to highlight one really exciting program that's coming up. Um, if you take a look at the comic on the right, 
this is the same uh, artist that drew the, the comic I shared earlier with the bird fluff barometer. Uh, her name is Rosemary Mosco. Uh, if you've never heard of her before, her comics are known as bird and moon comics. You can see the link on the bottom, birdandmoon.com. She is by far my favorite nature related artist in comic and I like a lot of them. So that's, that's saying something. Um, but as an artist myself, I just, she's really, really great at illustrating uh, literally her, her ideas and getting the point across in a comic, but intelligent, uh, thought provoking way. So you can see here, she's got one about foraging patterns, which is one of, one of my favorites. And we are really excited at Pickering Creek because she is going to be doing a program for us over Zoom uh, on Thursday, February 11th. It's just $7 to register um, per computer. Um, you can register now on our website. Um, we are all really, really excited for that. So we're trying to spread the word on, we hope to see some of you join us there. And we will uh, put the link for that in our chat. Uh, so I'm gonna wrap up again by saying, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I hope everyone learned something new. Uh, and uh, as we're wrapping up, please feel free to unmute and ask any questions that you have or type them into the chat. And I'm going to stop sharing so I can start to see some of our faces. So thanks again. Thank you so much, Sammy. And you do have a couple of questions that have already been floating in the chat. <laughs> One of the ones related to countercurrent exchange is how do uh, birds avoid temp, temp, uh, tissue damage? when they are with these cold feet they have? Good question. Um, I don't know as much about the physical part of it, but I can say that I know because their feet are a little bit less fleshy. If you've ever touched or held a bird foot, it's, it's not as, there's not a lot of tissue, there's not a lot of fat there. So it's a lot less prone to that tissue damage. Um, but I won't say more than that because I don't know any more specifics. I don't wanna tell you something wrong, but really good question. Another related to the woodpeckers, uh, why would a woodpecker abandon a perfectly good uh, winter roosting cavity and make another one? Wouldn't that waste its energy? Good question. Again, I don't know specifically. Um, my guess would be that maybe they weren't super satisfied with it the first way around. <laughs> uh, they may also take the opportunity to forage in new locations for new insects and then make a new cavity there once they've already started foraging. So they might be looking for a new location that way. They might also be scouting for new nesting areas uh, for the spring and the summer once it gets a little bit warmer. Good question. Thank you everyone.